mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they, they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Good morning, everyone. We are so grateful that you are here today with us, and uh, we do have a couple of guests with us. We're thankful that you've come our way. Um, we do get sometimes and steeped our own traditions, and I always find that amusing as uh, Stuart forgot to have a stand for that last song. I looked around, and I saw all of these nervous looks, like especially that old Owens row and clan. I don't know why they're looking at me. Was I supposed to take the lead and stand up? And I thought, we do have our traditions, don't we? But that's all right. Having um, a degree in communication studies and with a special emphasis in rhetoric and American public address, uh, I have studied numerous multiple communication models uh, through the years, and these are models that have been developed uh, to improve both speaking and listening skills. And when you look at the whole matter of communication, and this is just kind of one silly model, I mean these are the kinds of things that they use, and I wanted to pick something that was rather simple, and you don't have to even worry about that, it's just simply an illustration. Because there are some that are vastly more complex than this. But when you think about the whole matter of communication, and especially verbal communication, what is important is not simply the message that is being communicated, even as this talks about the channel and the one who is giving forth the message, but a great part of the communication process is the reception of it as well. Not only do we need to try to speak or to communicate in effective ways whereby we get the message across with clarity and with understanding. But also we have to be willing, ready recipients of the message if we want to appreciate what communication is all about. I think it's effective communication we're always looking for. If it's between a preacher and a congregation of people, if it's from brother to brother, or brother to sister, or however you want to look at that. If it is from husband to wife, or parent to child, or neighbor to neighbor, I ask you, how important is communication in our lives? We look at Scripture, and we understand that according to Scripture, communication is very powerful. The spoken word, verbal communication, is extremely powerful. And better communication, again, is something that we all desire. And this is especially true among brethren in Christ as Christians. But we must appreciate the fact that what we say, what we say, how we say it, and then even how we receive communication is really, really important. I thought of some scriptures several scriptures, but just two that I wanted to share with you by way of introduction 
When we speak about communication, talking to one another, brethren, and I don't care if it's in the foyer of the church building, in a Bible class where there's open discussion, coming to somebody's house or talking on the phone, and even though it's not verbal, or even if it's communicating by virtue of social media and communicating with people, this is a powerful dynamic. You know, what we find in proverbial wisdom is Solomon says in Proverbs 18.21 that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And in Scripture, the tongue is frequently used as a figure of speech, of speaking, of spoken language or communication. I want you to think about that. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You see, what we say and how we say it and how we portray and the attitudes, I should say, we portray when we speak, is there an accountability for it? Are we going to be responsible, accountable for the words that we speak and sometimes the words we don't speak? Do you know that intended, projected silence is a form of communication? And it can be good, but it can also be very hurtful. Have you ever been there? Now, inasmuch as Solomon says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and we ought to take this to heart, then Jesus stated, as we would read in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37, as he spoke to a gathering of Jews in that particular scenario, and there he says, For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Words. Spoken words. Again, words we speak to our spouse, to our children, to our brethren, to our neighbor, to our fellow workers. By your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And words are powerful. In the reading that Zachary did for us just a couple of moments ago, and you may want to turn your Bibles back to that text in in James chapter 3. And if we were to do just kind of a brief outline with what James is doing, and he speaks about the influence, the power of spoken verbal communication. In fact, verse 1 really helps set the tone. But I wanted to read verses 2 through 12. But remember, James 3, 1 says, Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you shall receive a stricter judgment. How important is it for the accuracy of words that are taught and words that are preached when it comes to the things of God's word and of spiritual messages? See, brethren, I understand this, that what I preach and what I teach, what I specifically say, the attitude that I portray, and as I try to persuade and influence, and you know what I'm trying to do right now? I'm trying to persuade you. I'm trying to influence you. But am I going to be held accountable for what I teach and what I preach and how I try to use my own powers of persuasion from an oratory standpoint? He says, let not many of you become teachers knowing you shall incur. You're going to receive a stricter judgment that's haunting at times. But then he goes on to speak, address this matter of spoken communication. And he talks about the perfect man. And I've got to tell you, when I read this, I find in myself how I so much fall short of the model that he's portrayed in James 3. He says the perfect man. You see, this is the perfect man that he knows how to control what he says. Control the tongue. And the man that knows how To control himself that he'll say what needs to be said, but at the right time and in the right way. The man that has that much control upon the way he speaks. He says, that man is a perfect man indeed, that he has control of his whole body. And I found that to be true. Brethren and friends, I want you to think about this one. If we can reach that maturity level. That no matter what the circumstance is, that we know when to speak and what and when not to speak. And when we know how to say it and to say it in the right way, with the right tone, the right attitude. 
And in all the given circumstances, when a person has that much maturity, and that they're able to say it, say it the right way at the right time, you know, that's an individual that has a pretty good grasp on life altogether. So what does he do? He talks about bridles, bits, and rudders. And he talks about how small things control larger things. And some of you are much more familiar about controlling and riding horses than I am. I've done very little of it through the years, a little bit. And yet I think we all understand that you take a massive horse. This is a large animal that is much larger, stronger than we are. And yet why is it that we put a bit in the horse, horse's mouth or, or bridle the horse? Because we can with a relatively small item. We can control the direction of that horse, can we not? And when you look even in the massive ships of the sea, and I think about it as we were driving south here a couple of weeks ago and going along the coastline, and something we used to see a lot here, but you don't, we just don't anymore. But remember for years, as we saw around in the Cayucas area, the, the big oil tankers that would come, and those are massive ships. And yet, comparatively speaking, that in the direction of those ships, they have a rudder at the rear of the ship. I know it's not called a rear, but that's what I call it. But that relatively small rudder controls the direction of that ship. Small things control bigger things. What's James saying? The tongue is a small member. But how many times do we get ourselves in trouble because of what we say, what we speak? Is that not just about all of us? Once again, guilt is charged. He speaks about this. He speaks about force fires. And then all it takes is a small spark, a little flame. And it starts and it can just destroy with that small beginning tens of thousands of acres of beautiful forest. We've seen it in Yosemite. We've seen it in Yellowstone. We've seen it in these areas that were just beautiful. And something very small, wildfire. Can that not happen with a spoken word and create incredible damage in the relationships of people? It can happen in a family. It can happen in a congregation. This is what James is saying. He said they're wild beasts. They're birds or reptiles and sea creatures and, and so many of these things. That, that They're wild beasts and yet they can be tamed. Jay was speaking to me earlier between services about things about Hold them to this, kids. It's about time to take your kids back up to the Monterey Aquarium. You know, it changes every now and again. They have new exhibits. But what's amazing to me is you go to an aquarium like there in Monterey and, and, and how they're able to, to take certain animals and sea creatures. And I've seen some exhibits there, those that have gone to SeaWorld and, and San Diego. But they take these amazing creatures and they can, to a certain way, tame them or, or train them. And yet James asked the question, who can tame the tongue? I think we see his point. He says it's a deadly poison. Words can be so poisonous. And I want to say again, silence can be poisonous. And it doesn't have to be a lot of words. It can be just a few words or again, no words. It's a deadly poison that can absolutely destroy relationships in a heartbeat. He says, can you imagine, as James portrayed this, from the same mouth, from the same tongue, proceeds blessings? Oh, we sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. We sing songs to God in praise and adoration. We sing together. We sing today in 394. Love one another. Love one another. Did we all sing that together today? And out of this mouth proceed blessings. And then from the mouth, same mouth can come forth cursings. It could be ridicule. It could be negativity. It could be a lot of different things that we'd find in violations of pure speech. But the point is, he says, these things ought not to be so. That he says, there's an inconsistency. And then he talks about figs and olives and, and grapes and spring water and salt water. And what he shows is that a spring, for example, that produces spring water, you're not going to get salt water out of it. And vice versa. He says, and you're not going to find olives on a fig tree or grapes on an olive tree and vice versa and all around. What is he saying? 
He says the inconsistency of the human being is this. Is that human beings have a difficulty in controlling what they say and how they say the things that they do say. Is this, do you find this to be indicting? I do. Earlier in the book of James, James offers to us what I want to refer to as and bring to your attention what I call a communication formula. In James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. A communication formula. And as we read this together, it is an amazing formula. And he says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man... Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath or anger. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. This is a communication formula. To do what? To be swift to hear. Swift to listen. Slow to speak and slow to wrath. And what's interesting about this, because accuracy is absolutely paramount in effective communication. And so James employs two words commonly used for measuring speed. Swift and slow. When he says, so then my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, it's an interesting Greek word that's used only one time in the New Testament text. It's found in a lot of the classical literature of Greece. And even a word today in modern Grecian language. And it's takus. What's a tachometer? You know, tach, tachometer, and it measures what? RPM. And it has to do with the speed of revolutions per minute. And it's the word that is used here, swiftness, quickness. It was a term that was used for measuring speed, swift, promptly, ready. And what he says, and this is so interesting, to be swift, that is quick to hear, to listen. Now in contrast, he uses A different word, obviously, when he says slow to speak and slow to wrath. The same word, and this is brakus. And how I always remember this is brakus is that you need to put on the bracks, you need to put on the brakes. We need to slow down. Do you get it? And this is a word that metaphorically means dull. It's an active word. Inactive in mind. It's found only three times in all the New Testament. The two times here in James. And once used by Jesus when he was addressing some that were not good listeners and were not, did not have the right attitude. But he says to them in Luke 24 and verse 25, here's the word. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe. Very sluggish to believe. And all that the prophets have spoken. It's an interesting, interesting word. But what is he saying now? While it's used in a negative sense by Jesus towards these people that were were very sluggish in applying what they knew what was right, James is using it in this situation in a very positive way that what we need to do is we need to be slow to speak and be slow to wrath, slow to getting angry or upset or mad as we'll talk about. Now that's the text. And my friends, I want to say to you that accelerating listening and decelerating responding is wise. You see what I'm saying? We need to accelerate our listening skills, our desire and ability to listen and decelerate our responses. So he says slow to speak. Or excuse me, swift to hear. He says swift to hear. We look at this, and and I just I say to you emphatically, 
When he says swift to hear, I just want to say emphatically, listen. How many times does this take place between us in important areas of communication relationships, husbands and wives? And have you ever been there in discussion and talking with your spouse? And maybe there is a, a contentious point. Maybe there is a disagreement. Something's going on. But have you ever said to your spouse, would you just listen to me, please? Just listen. And we would all do well in those relationships, all relationships. We need to be swift to listen. And what that means is I am willing and ready and eager to hear you. Try to understand what the other is saying before making a response or even forming an opinion. That's not easy to do. Swift to hear. Truly listen to what the other person is saying. But so often what happens is as they're speaking, and then we begin to sometimes jump to conclusions or make an assumption, and then we start formulating our opinions or response to this, and so many times this happens, we haven't truly listened to what the other is saying. It is a common, common problem or failure and even shutdown to communication. And I'll tell you that according to the Bible, good listening skills demonstrates wisdom, godly wisdom. Last Wednesday evening, David Smith gave a good invitation and he was dealing with Job. And he especially dealt with the couple, first couple of chapters of Job. And the point that David wanted to bring out about Job was that Job was tested and tried and went through just terrible, terrible situations in his life. And losing his children and servants and his livestock and so many things. And his life was unraveling before him. And then even later on when his own personal body was assaulted and afflicted with boils and sores and just terrible, terrible physical conditions. And yet in all of this that the Bible says that, that Job, he did not curse God. He did not curse God. He did not charge God with wrongdoing. And Job had the attitude, the Lord, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be in the name of the Lord. And that's a great lesson, isn't it? There always is. And even Dave even alluded to the point that Job in time would have three friends. And these three friends who are just sure that Job's in the terrible situation that he is because of a sin in his life. And that's not what it was all about. We, we know that God allowed Satan to tempt, to tempt and test Job. But here's these three friends. And they're nothing more than psycho babblers giving a lot of bad advice and information. Job was confused about many things. Job asked a lot of questions. When you read all of the chapters and the long, long passages is where Job, he's making statements, he's asking questions. He does not accuse God of wrong. But he's very confused and very frustrated. And in his frustration, and who wouldn't be? He needed to hear a voice of reason. And the three friends did too. And that's where this individual near the end of the book by the name of Elihu steps up. And he was younger than Job and the three friends. And so he was very reticent, hesitant about even addressing. And he was almost apologetic, but he knew something needs to be said, a voice of reason. And he actually rebukes the three friends and said, you fellows are not being real friends at all. And, he, and frankly, he said to them, you don't know what you're talking about. But he said in a very nice, eloquent way. And he says, Job... You're asking a lot of questions and you're manifesting some frustration here that you need to rethink a couple of things about life. And I think what we need to understand is that as he was listening to all of this Elihu, and he was listening very carefully, he knew that he needed to become this voice of reason. And just, just a couple of these passages, Job 30. 3 and verse 1, he says, But please, Job, hear my speech and listen to all my words. Listen. Job needed to listen. In chapter 33 and verse 31, he says, Give ear, Job. Listen to me. Hold your peace and I will speak. You know, that's what we need to do. Hold your peace. Let people speak and listen. Verse 32, if you have anything to say, answer me, speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me. Hold your peace and I will teach you wisdom. 
In chapter 34 and verse 16, he says, there Elihu says to Job, if you have understanding, hear this. Listen to the sound of my words. And I could give him many, many other examples of it in these last several chapters. I want to ask you, brethren, are we swift to hear when somebody's trying to be the voice of reason? I think we struggle with that from time to time. In Proverbs 7, verse 24, the wise man says, Now therefore, listen to me. And he's talking to not just the nation of Israel generically, but very much to his own sons, his own family, based on his own experiences. But he says, Now therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Because he had some wise words to share with them. And how many of us have been there as parents with our children? Because we've been there perhaps. We've done that. We know the experience. And we've seen it. And we're just, we're almost pleading with our children. Would you please listen? You see, many quit listening. As they are trying to formulate a response or a rebuttal. I'll tell you, this is a breakdown in effective communication. And we need to be swift to hear. Now, you talk about a contrast, going back to our text here. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. That here's the contrast. He says, then slow to speak. Put on the brakes. In many respects, fundamentally what you have here is understanding the importance of, that we need to process. As we are being swift to hear or listen, paying attention, then as we need to slow our brain down a little bit in a response and start processing. Process before you speak. That's why you'll slow down. Have you ever said that to somebody? Been in situations. Have you ever been in a kind of a, a tragic or panic situation and somebody comes up to you and they're talking to you about 100 miles an hour? And when sometimes you have to say, whoa, 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 just slow down, slow down. Let's process this. That's what we need to do. Slow to speak. What James idiomatically is really saying here is that you need to measure your words carefully. Slow down and think about it before you speak. Even if a reply is needed, take your time. Think before engaging or speaking. And again, what a contrast that is, because he said, swift to hear. That's something that we ought to quickly, speedily be ready to do, to listen. Really listen. But slow to speak. Remember this. That spoken words cannot be recalled. But they can be regretted. And often are. And who among us have not spoken something. Rashly and brashly. Only later to regret it. We've all been there. I know I have. We listen again to some proverbial wisdom and measure verbal responses. In Proverbs 29 and verse 20, the wise man says, Do you see a man hasty in his words? This is one who's quick to speak, quick to make a response. Here's my opinion. Here's my response. Here's my feeling about it. He says, There is more hope for a fool than for him. In Proverbs 14, 33, wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding, but what is in the heart of a fool is made known. The heart of a fool, he just, he just makes it known. He lets it known. Proverbs 12, verse 23, a prudent, that is a wise man, a prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of, a, of fools proclaims foolishness. Now, knowledge there isn't a knowledge of God's word, Sometimes we are just knowledgeable, that is, we know about a lot of things because maybe we saw it or we heard about it, it became known to us. 
But are there a lot of things that we are aware of, that we've been made privy of, that we are knowledgeable of, that we shouldn't share, we shouldn't speak about? Oh, all kinds of things. You know, it just goes back to the whole problem of gossip and a misunderstanding of what gossip is. Gossip is not just saying something about another person if you're thinking that it's, well, something that may not be true or accurate. No, gossip could be talking about another person and what you're saying may be very true, very factual, but we have no business telling anybody else about it. And the gossip equation is not just that are speaking the gossip, but those that would sit there and be willing to receive it, to listen to it, to entertain it. Are not both parties guilty as charged? There's some things that we may know about, knowledge, Zip it. In Proverbs 29, verse 11, a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. I love the example of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the cup bearer for the king. And it, was, it wasn't even one of the king of Israel. It was, it was, a, it was a pagan king. And the king loved Nehemiah, had great respect for him. But he saw that Nehemiah was down, very, very down. And Nehemiah was down for good reasons, because while the temple had been rebuilt, a lot of the other construction had, 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 had stopped again. The walls are in shambles. The, the attitude of the people of, of Israel, the captive people, is very, very poor. And God's using Nehemiah in a prophetic office as well. And Nehemiah knows that there's troubles. And he's very down about this. And the king comes to Nehemiah and he says, Nehemiah, what's the problem? And I love this passage. You find this in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 4. And Nehemiah, he records, he says, Then the king said to me, what do you request? You see, the king was, okay, what do you want, Nehemiah? How can I help you? But I love this. He said, so I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. You see, he's miles and miles away, and what's happening? Jerusalem is not, that Jerusalem task has not been completed. And he knew this was going to be a big, big favor he's going to ask of the king. Then the king said to me, verse 6, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me and I, and, I, and I gave him or I sent him a time. But did you get what he said when the king comes up to him and says, what can I do for you? What favor can I grant you? What's the first thing that Nehemiah did before responding? I prayed to God. Brethren, in our slowness to speak a part of that process I think we would do so very well to pray for wisdom before speaking what do you think think of what you're saying think how it will sound to the other one who is hearing it and how it will sound if it is repeated to someone else or how it will affect them or impact them. Ask yourself. Ask yourself if what you're about to say will do good or will do harm. Now while we're primarily talking about verbal communication, I said earlier on, there's lots of forms of communication. You might be leaving a voicemail on somebody's telephone. You might be contacting somebody by virtue of email or, again, the social media. And I'll tell you what I don't like about that, the social media, is the lack of wisdom that is used, that, that's displayed by many, many people that just kind of put it out there for everybody to see and hear. We're coming back, and, and Vicki brought something to my attention. Yesterday, we had gone over to the valley to go to a gospel meeting up around the Modesto area. And, and to listen to, uh, to Homer Walker Jr., as a matter of fact, in Escalon. And we're sitting at a restaurant afterwards, and Vicky says, Brent, look at this. And, and all I can tell you is that 
it was a situation that somebody had verbalized something that is being seen by everybody. Not of this congregation, but it's a Christian. And it was something that has no business being communicated the way that it was. And I'm going to tell you what, there was a failure to process. And while the social media, there's so much value to it. There's so much good that can come. It's like anything. We have to also understand that when it's not used appropriately of how damaging it can become. Because people are not being slow to speak. Well, we finally come to the end of this passage. And when he says, be swift to hear, slow to speak. Then he says, also put the brakes on for this. And that is slow to wrath. And when we process this, when we look at the dynamic here, it's patience. Brethren, I have no, no problem in asking this. Would you please be patient with me? What I preach, what I teach, maybe how I've talked to you. Maybe things I've done or things I've failed to do or failed to see and understand. Now maybe you have good reason to be upset about something. Come and talk to me about it. But be slow to wrath. Be slow to wrath. Because I don't always get it. And so in this processing, there has to be patience. Anger usually breaks down communication and severely jeopardizes relationships. You know how some rationalize? Well, my being upset, my anger, my disapproval is really righteous indignation. Well, that's a very relative thing. Is that so? We need to remember, even as the text says in verse 20 at the end there, and from the New American Standard Version, uh, New American Standard Bible in verse 20, remember that the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And here's some more proverbial wisdom, wisdom of Solomon of, of, in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 14, 29. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. Proverbs 15, 18, a wrathful man stirs up strife, but he was slow to anger. Allays contention, that is, he will put off contention. Proverbs 16, 32, he was slow to anger, is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit, that is, controls his attitude, his temperament, than he who takes a city. You know what we have to do? We need to resolve our, our... If we have issues... Husbands and wives, do you ever have issues with one another? Parents and children, do you ever have issues with one another? Brethren, do we ever have issues with one another? You know, an inspiration tells us, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.26, there Paul says, be angry. There can be a reason why we can be angry. And do not sin, though. Don't sin. Don't allow that anger to overtake you to control your life. And do not let the sun go down on your wrath. You see, Jesus taught in Matthew 5 that if you go to offer a gift or go to worship and remember that you have something against your brother, what did he say to do? Go to your brother first and get that resolved before you offer your gift for come and worship do we believe that? You see, that's being slow to wrath. And that means we resolve the issue. And if we will go to people, not with a sword in one hand and the spear in the other. And if we go to people with patience and with love and with the desire to make the relationship better. I think, especially amongst brethren... And hopefully amongst husbands and wives and parents and children, I think the vast majority of time that if it's approached correctly, I think the issues will be resolved. It'll get better. In fact, may 
very well make the relationship stronger. The anger here, by the way, that he uses, Paul used a very interesting word, interesting family of words, orgizo. And in orgizo is, is, is the, to become excessively exasperated. Have you ever become exasperated with people or situations? And that exasperation sometimes can cause us to do or to think or to say or to act in ways that we should not. Resolve anger. Brethren, I say to you, in conclusion, God does not want us storing up or holding on to any form of anger, wrath, or hard feelings towards one another. We're brethren, we're family, we're friends, and I hope we all have the same goal. This is a formula that we must all put into practice to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. As Jesus said, for by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Words must be chosen carefully. Attitudes must be developed that foster understanding, compassion, and love. Patience must be exercised as we re relate to one another as people, as brethren in Christ. And I hope that we will better appreciate this communication form. I'll tell you, the greatest part of verbal communication is this. Confessing before others that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior at all. There are no better words than that. To say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And with that confession of faith, say, I am willing to submit to God. And I am willing to, because I feel bad about my sins, I want my sins washed away, I want them taken away, and I will submit, I want to be baptized into Christ and give that confession of faith. I cannot think of better, stronger, more positive words than that. And those need to be carefully measured words too because it is to be a life of commitment. We offer to you the invitation of the Lord himself. If we can assist you with that or any other spiritual need, please, won't you come as we stand.